Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today we welcome back Checkmate, who is now flying under his own flag, Check on Chain. Check, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Nick, mate. It's great to be back. Okay, so let's get right into it. You describe Bitcoin as this unprecedented asset class, and we have a chart to describe why that is the case. It's comparing Bitcoin's returns on a four year time horizon to traditional assets. Walk us through this chart here. Yeah, so we're looking at the uh, the compound annual growth rate for uh, for Bitcoin. And, you know, I've got a couple of charts I've been building just, you know, as you test how Bitcoin performs uh, relative to other asset classes. And I think that's, that's kind of where we're at in Bitcoin's life cycle is you've got a lot of TradFi analysts who they're still on the fence. They still don't quite get it. And you have to bring it into their world. You have to actually bring all these metrics and how you want to measure it, whether it's sharp ratios or compound annual growth, whatever kind of metrics they're used to seeing uh, and actually present it to them and say, look, you know, this thing is uh, outperforming bonds. It's outperforming gold. It's outperforming stocks. Um, so the chart we're looking at is essentially a compound annual growth rate. Um, Bitcoin's there in the line chart. And then down the bottom is just the, the same, the four year compound annual growth um, for all of these other asset classes. Uh, and, you know, you can see that it's kind of like a, a smear of color at the bottom and uh, Bitcoin really stands out pretty significantly. Now, of course, it goes through the volatile upswings and downswings and four years is obviously Bitcoin's natural cycle. If you did it over one year during a bear market, it'll look a little bit worse. But it's one of these dynamics where over any kind of meaningful time period and Bitcoin, I think that's a very consistent narrative and stories. It's, it's about the long term, right? It's not for the money in the short term. That volatility kind of impacts it. But I mean, there's other charts like this where you look at sharp ratio or Sortino ratio, which actually compares that volatility to risk. And Bitcoin essentially rewards people for taking that risk as well. So uh, bring it into the TradFi world, it becomes hard to argue with the numbers. Yeah. And what we're looking at here in the orange line is, is it never goes negative. And the reason is because on any trailing four-year time horizon, you have always had a healthy return in Bitcoin. And that healthy return, the minimum healthy return is appears to be at the top end of the range of any other asset class for the last couple decades, basically, on, a, on that same four-year trailing return. So that's why this orange line doesn't go negative, even though, as you, as you said, Bitcoin has nasty bear markets, but those are, they're never four years. And that's uh, in one way, what this chart is telling you. Uh, anything to add, check, in, in, uh, before I go to the next one? No, I think it's just, a, it's one of those things where the numbers become undeniable, right? The longer that this thing keeps ticking on, and even at the bottom of the bear, it was like 30 odd percent um, compound growth. Now we're up at 72. So, you know, a, a single year can make a really big difference. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by River. Make sure to check out river.com today or the link below in the description. River is our preferred place to purchase Bitcoin. Now, when you're buying Bitcoin, guys, there are several considerations. Number one, should I be using an exchange? Is the exchange custodying their own Bitcoin? Is the exchange using platforms to custody that we don't know? Is the exchange leveraging its Bitcoin for other purposes? Well, with River, we know that River does not use leverage of any kind. River also uses its own multi-sig solution so that your Bitcoin are not held by anybody else. So it's a very important thing to understand about what River offers. Now, River also has Lightning Network integration and a lot of other really exciting features. Go check out river.com today. Sure, so let's get into the bear, uh, little bear drawdown that we've had here amidst what you are classifying. We also believe that's our own opinion, but in yours, I know that you believe we are mid bull market. We want to hear more about that today from you, where we are in that. But let's start with this chart of bull market drawdowns. The current drawdowns are toward the right hand side of the chart in purple. And just from an optical standpoint, the thing that jumps out at you is that in this current bull market, in which Bitcoin has has done a, a forex off of the lows, we're a, off a little bit from that. But the drawdowns on the way up are very muted relative to the last bull market, 
and somewhat even muted to the previous bull market. That previous one in blue being the 2016-2017 bull, and then the green being the 2021 bull, 2020 and 2021. And so the drawdowns here, they're just not... Where are they? Like, where as are someone they? who's been around Bitcoin for a while, you get used to these like 50 percenters, 30 percenters, and your gut, you feel it. You're like, oh man, what was that? So, and we just haven't so, really had them. So, are we so are we about to get our first 50, or why haven't we had them? What's your opinion? Uh, this, is, this is a great question. So, uh, the, the, the real question here is like, why haven't we had these big corrections? Now, there, there's kind of two answers. If I if I go back and look at 2023, and actually I did a study on this, I'll, I'll be writing about this soon. I spent some time looking at the amount of sell side. You can look at things like um, uh, CVD metrics, basically looking at what, what people who are hitting the market buy or sell, what was their general frame of reference. Through most of 2023, right, we barely had a 20% correction. Almost everyone was hitting market sell. So my read from that is that there was someone underneath there who was some patient large scale buyer who was just absorbing those coins. They weren't hitting market buy. They weren't in any kind of rush. They were just allowing the market to come to them and just selling into their position. So to my view, what 2023 was, so this is kind of the sub 40K range. Um, there was just coins getting soaked up, right? It's probably the best description and the market just wouldn't go down. Now, I only found this data recently and uh, I was looking at this particular drawdown chart and going, why are we just not getting the drawdown? And my instinct, my gut feel was, there's someone who's just there just patiently soaking up the coins. And I think that what I'm, the more I look at it, the more data I'm finding to really justify that position. Now, there's one other component in the, the news that we released recently. It's a very similar chart. So same color scheme, same setup, except instead of looking at price and drawdowns, I look at the percent of supply in profit. And the drawdowns is how much coins have gone from in profit to in loss. Now, I use this. I talk about this concept called top heaviness quite a bit. So um, where we are in the cycle usually depends on how many people have recently bought their coins. So at the top of a market in a bull cycle, too many people buy too many coins at too high of a price. And then what happens is the market gets a correction. It's not just a normal correction. You get a huge chunk of the supply become panic prone. And that's what then precipitates this kind of cascade of selling. And uh, you know we've seen a lot of selling. There's been long-term holders, there's GBTC, there's all of this stuff going on. And yet, when we look at things that we're trading at like 60K, the bottom of that trade range, we just haven't seen what I would call a top heavy market yet. Um, the short term holder cost base, about 58K, would be that level where it could kick in. But at this point in time, it looks remarkably healthy. So, uh, you know, uh, until kind of further evidence, it really does look like we haven't got that like excessive buy side at the top. Um, and as a result, that cascade that I just not seeing the risk of that just yet. So now let's talk about VDD. You mentioned VDD. This is value days destroyed. So this next chart here, talk to us about the most recent VDD spike and explain what that means. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, this is a metric that was developed by, uh, by TXMC uh, back in the day, and uh, it's called the value days destroyed multiple. Now, in the world of on-chain data, we can measure how long a coin was held for um, the profit that it's taking or the loss that it's taking when it's spent. You're basically measuring the acquisition point. You start measuring time and price and then the point of disposal, time and price. So what the value days destroyed, it's looking at that time component. So it's looking at when it, when it spikes, it's telling us lots of coins that have a lot of coin days or holding time are being spent. So this is usually synonymous with the long-term holder cohort. So what I was mentioning before, where you've got too many coins that get bought at a high level, this is coming from the perspective of who sold them. And it's usually people who acquired those coins at much cheaper prices. They've held them for years um, and now they're starting to unload. Now, why do they start to spend? And you'll actually see in this chart, we usually actually get a, a peak very soon after breaking all time highs. And this is because if you're a seller, you need a buyer, right? That's kind of, the, the, you need to be matched with somebody. So what these longer term holders do and historically speaking, it's almost like clockwork. As we approach and break through all-time high, there's this influx of new buyers, right? New demand comes in, people see new all-time highs, they get excited, more dollars come in. They usually take that as a moment of exit liquidity, right? So they, they see that there is an almost guaranteed pool of people coming in and you get this large scale expenditure of these coins, which causes coin day destruction to spike. And that's why your VDD multiple also peaks. 
Now, it obviously peaks within raging bull markets. So a lot of people would then look at it and go, oh, this looks a little bit scary. And that's that's kind of what warranted writing the piece is going, okay, we've got this metric firing up. We can see long-term holders selling. Are we actually at a point of risk? Have we seen that like kind of like blow off top type behavior already? Um, or is this something that looks a lot more like just a mid-cycle pause? So explain to me what the multiple is then. Yes. So the, the concept of the multiple, um, this actually goes back to, uh, to Dave Puel, who came up with the, uh, the Puel multiple. Um, it's essentially just taking whatever the metric is that we've designed. Um, in this instance, we're looking at value day destruction. Um, and what we then do is divide it by its 360 day moving average. So what we're kind of doing there is looking at the, a longer term baseline because um, quite often metrics and things will drift over time because market structure changes. 2013 isn't the same as 2021, 24. So when you divide it by itself and you bring back like it's a longer term, slower moving average, you're kind of giving it itself as an anchor. That's your reference point rather than horizontal and allowing things to drift. Um, we've, I've, well, I've certainly found that in on-chain data, using the multiple approach, which is just dividing by some longer-term moving average, can really help smooth out signals. Um, it just normalizes things, right? It allows us to compare different cycles, so we look at like for like. Perfect. And so the the multiple itself is looking at the spot value days destroyed divided by the trailing 365-day moving average at that given point yes. on the graph. Yes, with, with, with some other adjustments, but yeah, that's the general concept. Of course. And so just for the audience, that's basically what when we think about Bitcoin's price versus its 200 week moving average, it's uh, that's the the metaphor. The multiple. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 basically, you know, a way of thinking of Bitcoin's price relative to itself and itself being the long term uh, average of that. Okay, so it's also we, a um, it's also a good just one last point. It's a good tool for momentum. So you know, MVRV is a very popular and, and most people know what MVRV is. Um, it also, if you look at its momentum, right, when MVRV slices below its one year moving average or breaks above, very often it's actually a, a serious change in market momentum. So it's a, a just a nice cross check when you're looking at okay, the regime appears to have changed or not. So it's another framework for that too. Okay, so we are now going to, in post, pull our MVRV chart and put a moving average of the MVRV on to the chart itself in a nice bright color so that we can all see that. Nice. Um, and, and of course, our viewers will know what MVRV and if they need a, an information overview on that, Check has an excellent show on real uh, an overview on realized price and i did one recently at the bitcoin layer it's called what is bitcoin realized price and you guys can go check out that explainer um let's go to the next chart and talk about actually let's not go to the next chart i want to ask you one more question about value days destroyed here so old old coins are being spent in a an in a new all-time high coins are being destroyed as people that have held for a long time are finally looking for some exit liquidity. We've seen uh, anecdotal stories of that as well. So why is that a uh, mid cycle bull market indicator for you this time around, as opposed to an end cycle indicator? Good question. So the answer is it could be either. And that was kind of what prompted me to say, okay, now that we've got value days destroyed peaking, it's time to look into the mechanics of what's going on. So there's two sides. What created the, the VDD peak? And what does that mean for the market moving forward? So what created it? Um, I've done some studies looking at uh, long-term holder spending and comparing it to GBTC because a very common piece of feedback that I would get is, hang on a second, all these metrics are inflated because GBTC is, is selling. And I, I thought about this for a long time and I ended up coming to the conclusion, well, I don't remember the last time that I asked the guy who I bought Bitcoin whether he was a bankrupt estate, whether he was FTX, whether he was Celsius, or whether he was just a hodler. So in many ways, it doesn't really matter that it's GBTC selling, because at the end of the day, one sold Bitcoin is the same as one sold Bitcoin. Now, the other argument there is, okay, well, how much of GBTC is rotating into the other ETFs? Well, we continue to see GBTC outflows well and truly outpace the inflows at the moment. We're seeing a net outflow uh, period of time. Some of them, and we're talking about multi-billion dollar estates. Um, so yes, there's going to be some people rotating, but GBTC is only about 30% of long-term holder selling. 
So the other 70 is just the your classic hodlers moving coins around. So of that 30%, how much of that is rotating? Well, you can kind of break it down. You start taking percentages of percentages of percentages and you go, it's probably not enough for me to change my thesis that the other 70% of people are still spending and you've got the bankrupt estates. So what creates that VDD multiple? It's literally coins being distributed, whether via a bankrupt estate or a hodler taking exit liquidity. So what does that then mean for the market? That's where we start to assess things like being, are we top heavy? Um, which I know there's some more charts later on in the deck, so maybe we can pause there, but uh, certainly looking at how many people actually bought up here, how many coins were distributed, and are we at risk of price falling below their cost basis, their realized price, and creating just a sense of panic, right? That's what breaks sentiment. That's what I'm looking out for. Okay, so you mentioned the GBTC outflows. Let's just go right to this chart on the ETF flows. You mentioned that we have declining ETF demand relative to the beginning period. So we still have demand, but it's, it is it is in decline. You have the persistent GBTC outflows. So what are your thoughts on ETF flows as they stand today? Yep, totally. So I think the, um, the and again, I'm not, uh, I will divert a little bit to the, the um, to Eric and James from Bloomberg who've been covering a lot of this. I saw one of their tweets the other day, they started to get numbers on who the actual holders are. Now, if I interpreted their, their charts correctly, it was kind of a table of who the different holders are. First things first, most of them have very, very small portions of their portfolio, like sub 0.1, 0.2%. Uh, most of them, you know, an order of magnitude less than that. So uh, their big takeaway is it kind of looks like it's mostly retail. And my kind of read from just all the information that's out there, it feels like a lot of the, the big institutional demand is still in the early phases of even just warming up, right? You've, a lot of these places need three, six, 12 months of trading history before they can even open it up. Um, so there's a whole process there. These things move a lot slower than people expect. So um, I think we've really seen the tip of the iceberg on those ETFs. Um, there's no question that they have slowed down. We've also seen trading volume slow down. But at the same time, we've been rallying for coming up to almost 18 months. So just purely from markets, right? You need to take a break. If you run a marathon in, you know, too quickly, you don't pause and just take a break and, and, and regulate things. You're just going to burn out. So in that regard, the market is well and truly due for a, a bit of a pause. Um, going back to MVRV, it also hit a level, I think it's 2.6, which is essentially saying the market's up about 160% on average. This is where people, we bump our heads all the time. 2019, we peaked here. Um, the 2021 all-time high, we actually peaked here. There's a whole bunch of levels that say, you know what? It feels like the market, it's ready for a break. Just just take a cool down, let the market consolidate, refine its level. Um, trade volumes are down, um, flows are down. GBTC continues to be kind of this structural outflow. Um, and my instinct is moving forward, we should be looking at GBTC as a... It, in fact, it will function even more like long-term holder supply the, the higher that we go. Because let's imagine you're a hodler, you've got spot Bitcoin, you've, you may even have some iBit and you've got GBTC. When the time comes that you want to take profit, which one of those are you going to sell? It's probably going to be the one that's giving you an absolute ride, 50% um, discount, and they're still charging you a 1.5% fee. So GBTC, I think, is going to be the preferred mechanism, the preferred vehicle for people to take profits. And as a result, I think, if it wasn't functioning as long-term holder supply now because of technicalities, it probably will be the higher up that we go. Check your analysis. It It's very important because you're bringing the on-chain and marrying it with the traditional finance and both need to be understood to actually understand internal price movements of Bitcoin within. Now, from our seat at the Bitcoin layer, because we're not in, we're not doing active price analysis from the detailed perspective that you are, I just want to emphasize why we at the Bitcoin layer are not able to do what Czech does, because he's looking at the on-chain very closely along with the Bitcoin traditional flows and every metric that he has access to on that side of things and marrying those two, trying to derive price analysis out of that from a Bitcoin perspective, we can't spend that time on that because we have to look at the global macro economy uh, at the same time as we look at the entire Bitcoin market. So just to show people 
you know, that there are different sectors to the Bitcoin research spectrum itself and why uh, checks analysis is in complement to ours. You mentioned it's, it is interesting because like it really is a um, it's kind of the division of labor, right? I mean, I, I study the macro stuff as well, but I can only like you only absorb certain bits of it, right? You can't be in there looking at treasuries and all that stuff. So it's about understand. And that's why it's all about finding um, your, your set of guys that you really trust, right? And, and following all and, and you find out what their analysis is and you allow them to do the proof of work for you. Right, and then you just you, you build those layers of trust with different people. I think it's a it's one of the beautiful things about the Bitcoin space. You've got so many people who are doing different sectors and specializing, and then kind of leveraging each other's skill set. I think it's fantastic. I just finished an episode with Jack Farley, which oh, will yes. ep- which will air after this one. Uh, this will go on Friday the nineteenth, and. Uh, Jack and I, I basically talked about how I start my day with Sofer and when Sofer goes from 5.32 to 5.34, it's a big deal for me and has me watching very closely only for it to go back down to 5.32 the next day. And I don't tell anybody about it because it's my own practice and it's my own study. And I can guarantee you guys at home that Checkmate is not starting his day with yesterday's SOFR quote. No, from strange the enough, I use SOPA, which is spent output profit ratio, which is telling me how much profit the market's locking in. Absolutely. And we'll get into SOPA in a second. <laughs> uh, but let's do the, the volume. So you mentioned volumes are down at ETFs. This next chart has the declining volume with a consolidating price. Bitcoin touched 60 it it actually dipped below 60 it's it's trading around 63 today as we record on Thursday afternoon here on April 18th in the US uh Friday morning already for you check um tell us about the declining ETF volumes with a consolidating price and what is your quick takeaway yeah absolutely so the um we have seen a decline in volume and you can actually look at it in the in the the, the volume chart alongside price, as you can probably expect, ETF trade volumes peak into the 73 all-time high. And they've been essentially declining in a, in a nice little triangle, um, which is very typical of consolidations, right? Over time, the market kind of trades in, you get these triangles form and you know whatever the chart pattern happens to be, volumes tend to tail off. Usually that's getting to the point where it's saying the market probably wants to move somewhere. Now, we've got another metric. So it's telling you that we're lower volatility at the moment relative to the the kind of ramping up that we had um, in previous months. So as the price consolidates and kind of readjusts and finds itself in a level, we've got another metric in the on-chain world, um, which we call sell-side risk ratio. And you talked about the realized price. We've got the realized cap. It's essentially looking at how many coins are moving and by what magnitude that are locking in a very large profit or a very large loss, and then comparing it to the realized cap. So in other words, um, show me how much the market is changing versus how big it is. That's kind of the way to think about it. And what we see is that during these periods of compressing trade volume and consolidation, most of the coins that are moving are not coming from 15K. They're not coming from, you know, when we were higher up from very large losses, they're coming from, if we're at 63, they're coming from 61, or they're coming from 63.5 you kind of get this like jostling around of coins where they're not moving far from their cost basis. It tells you that all the profit and loss that was going to be taken has been taken. And therefore the market needs to move up or down somewhere else to motivate those sellers, either via panic or greed. And we're seeing the same thing with these ETFs. You kind of get this compression of volume, the flows are slowing down, the market's kind of consolidating and correcting. Um, Eventually it's telling you that volatility is probably coming on the horizon. We're getting a compression of it. Um, On-chain is telling the same thing. So we're getting a cooling down and a refining of equilibrium. And then once markets find equilibrium, they like to move to something else. Okay. So a theme of compression of volatility, we will want to understand a little bit more. Uh, we'll, We'll go back and read your piece and try to understand a little bit more about why the compression of volatility is happening at this time. I want to ask you about this next chart with this with the euphoria zone. We're talking about MVRV ratio being around two and a quarter, uh, being the level at which we are calling euphoria on this chart. So these green shaded areas, and one of the key takeaways here is that 
the green areas don't mean you're at the peak. It can be on the they can happen on the way up several times repeatedly or for extended periods of time. So that's my big takeaway here. What what would you describe here with this euphoria zone chart? Yeah, so this is actually a, a, a you'll find this in a lot of my charts in this report actually. So that green zone has nothing to do with MVRV, which is kind of interesting. That is purely looking at when the a new price all-time high is happening every 30 days. But isn't it funny how MVRV intersects its one standard deviation level pretty much at the same time every cycle? So what is MVRV? At the end of the day, if we really peel back this skin, what is MVRV? It is the unrealized profit or loss held within the coin supply. So in other words, it's like the average, it's the average cost basis. So it's showing you kind of the, the composition of where coins were acquired during the previous cycles, because they're the coins that are going to be in profit. So what MVRV hitting this level at the same time that we break to new all-time highs, which is the green zone, it's really telling you that the market composition, the hodlers who bought and acquired and survived the bear, it's kind of the same as what we've seen in every previous cycle. It's a very, very interesting dynamic where we just get this, uh, Bitcoin goes through these four-year cycles because the hodlers make it be. Our behaviors and our actions is what creates the market structure. It's, it's, you know, it's these, these two things that feed off each other. Um, but what you can see there is that there's two lines. One is plus one, one is plus two standard deviation. So the layman's interpretation of that, show me when the market is in a statistically meaningful or an extremely statistically meaningful amount of profit. Now, why is that important? Because the more profit you're in, the more likely you are to start taking it. And that's essentially what we talked about before with the long-term holders and value days destroyed. People get into sufficient profit. They see a green enough number in their portfolio that they go, you know what? I've finished that trade. I'm going to close out some portion of my stack. I'm a trader. I'm just going to take some off the table, wh whatever it is, right? Or now this is life-changing money. I'm going to go and buy a house, whatever it, whatever it may be. So this is why those levels do what they do. It's, it's yes, MVRV is hitting the same level, but why is it hitting the same level? It's telling you about the composition of the hodlers. It's telling you about the amount of profit in the system. And more importantly, why do we pause here? Because the incentive of profit is now high enough for people to take chips off the table. And that's what counteracts the inflowing demand. It's so interesting to think about this chart along with the drawdown chart, because yes. they might be two sides of the same coin, which is, and, and then we bring back the theme of compressed volatility. They're all the same thing. Compressed volatility means you'll have less large drawdowns. The drawdowns will be uh, smaller in size because the, uh, because the buyer base is ready to come in and buy dips. And this on the other side of the coin, the seller base is quicker to basically take that 125% gain and not let it extend to 200% and 300% yet. And that, that part of it has to be fleshed out, of course, as on the downside too. We can't just celebrate and say we have compressed volatility down and up and it's over. We're in that range forever. But that is the going thesis. And really all of these charts, I just, it, the light bulb just clicked that they're all the same yes. expression of behavioral. And that's what Checkmate is so uh, often emphasizing is that this is all behavior on the screen. That's why you and I uh, immediately uh, connected on analysis is that you are looking at behavior when yes. you're looking at all these charts. It's why you yourself are obsessed with on-chain data because you're looking, you love to analyze the behavior itself. So it tells uh, a very consistent story. And you mentioned before, like you look at the traditional world um, and a lot of people are like, oh, on-chain has no signal because it's, you know, it's all spot and derivatives. So I went and looked at it and go, well, well hang on a second. There's 55,000 Bitcoin being deposited to exchanges every single day. I did some calcs the other day. It's 80% of the spot volume. And by the way, that amount is being withdrawn. So you've got 100,000 Bitcoin going in or out. And you've got, you know, less than that going on in spot market. So all of those coins carry signature of who held it, how long, how much profit, how much loss, um, you know, all these things. And when you see human beings behaving in aggregate, it's just such a beautiful picture. And it's also, 
Um, is that 100,000 Bitcoin going in or out of exchanges statistically significant in terms of the, the market? So for example, if I measure the, the sentiment in that 100,000 coins that are moving, do you think I could probably apply that to the other 19 point whatever million coins that are out there? Probably, right? It's, it's kind of this like overall sentiment gauge that tells you where the market is at by looking at a very large subset. You don't survey the whole population when you do these things. You survey a big chunk and you extrapolate to everybody else. And market analysis is doing much the same thing. And I had, I had definitely misinterpreted this chart uh, when I brought it up on screen, this euphoria zone. The green shaded areas are new all-time highs, basically these periods where Bitcoin starts to hit all-time highs. And the blue and red dotted lines are showing you the one and two standard deviation extensions of this MVRV ratio. Right. And they correlate in that the new all-time highs are profit-taking times for long-term holders. And in that way, the MVRV, uh, MVRV ratio declines as, or it hits resistance as people take profit at new all-time highs. So, And they just happen to be coincident because these things are behaviorally driven. Exactly. It, it, right. it's, it's one of these interesting things where it's like they're overlaid and they look like the green comes from the, the oscillator, but it doesn't. They're actually two different concepts, but it's, it's conveying that message of what are people actually doing? What are the incentive structure and what are they doing with it? Okay, so we teased top heaviness. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it now with this next chart, short-term holder supply in loss. How now bring back, you're saying we are not really in a period of top heaviness. So yep. explain that with using this chart now. Yep. So I think this is probably the most important takeaway from this opening piece. So the, let, let's just set the scene again, just to, to recap. We know lots of people are selling. We know that we're currently in a consolidation and we've traded down to below 60K. Um, there's been all sorts of, you know, the, the narrative can start to shift and go, oh man, is the top in? So the question is, let's, well, let's find out. So my definition of top heaviness, it's when, because we can measure when a coin is in profit and in loss. Now, we, we are at the most risk when lots and lots of people in very large size are at risk of going from in profit to in loss. Because you can essentially think about supply, it's kind of located along the price chart where people have bought and sold. If you've got a huge chunk of supply up there, that's going to become overhead supply for the, you know, that's what precipitates a bear. So what this chart is looking at in the orange is short-term holder supply. Now, these are coins that moved in the last five months. The best way to think about this, these are recent buyers. Now, the red part is um, uh, short-term supply in loss. And what I really distinguish here is there's two areas. You can clearly see bear markets, the supply and loss is massive. It pretty much fills up most of the space of the orange. It's telling you that the majority of people who recently bought are underwater, right? And that bear market continues, continues, continues. In the bull market uptrends, you get these spikes. Sometimes they get up to, I've got some mean and plus one standard deviation levels, but it, you know, 50%, 30% mm -hmm. of short-term holders. So in other words, um, up to half of all the people who recently bought are in loss at any one point in time. That's a normal, healthy garden variety correction. Now, the top heaviness occurs, you can see when the, the bull is done, 2017, even 2019 is a good example, 2021, it goes from like, you know, 30, 50% of in loss to pretty much everyone. That top heaviness is telling you, you have a lot of people who are now trapped. They are prone to panic. Um, you have to put at least one bear market goggle on and expect that this is what's coming. So it's just looking for regime shifts. Now, um, similar to that previous chart where we had the green that wasn't actually associated with the oscillator, in the price chart there, you'll see that there's a um, the, the red line is the short-term holder cost basis. So this has actually got nothing to do with, well, not nothing, but it's not measured from the supply chart down the bottom. But know that if I've got orange and red bubbles on the price, that's looking at when the, the coins in loss are above the average or above plus one standard deviation. Notice how they all flag when we drop below the short-term holder cost basis. So if you're looking at this from two different angles, we could just look at the supply and say, visually, we can see it's either top heavy or it's not. And right now it doesn't seem to be, right? We're, we're kind of on that precipice, but then you go, okay, 
every time we've dropped below the short-term holder cost basis, which is about 58,800 at the moment, then we've also triggered top heaviness. So these two things are kind of related in the sense that they tend to happen at the same time. So as a result, you can then kind of bring that analysis back and say, well, we're not top heavy right now. However, if we got down to 58.8 and we broke below it, the risk of us becoming top heavy is much, much higher. So that really becomes a very key level. Um, I would expect it to hold a support, but of course we don't know. It may not hold a support and if it doesn't, your bias just has to flip because you've now got a situation where you have a lot of people trapped at higher prices. Historically, this has precipitated a more bearish trend. So in terms of is it the top in, we will know if we get down below 58K, um, we'll probably get a, a pretty good piece of information as to whether that's true or not. Interesting to think about the short-term holders cost basis. So this is a subset of realized price. Um, if you want to think of it like that, a subset of those holders, their realized price is around 58K. If we go below that, that means that essentially all or the vast majority of short-term holders will be at a loss. And that will, sh that will demonstrate that has an opportunity to demonstrate top heaviness in the market. And so we'll be, we'll be watching for that. Um, Helps you prepare watching. for the road ahead. These, these are your conditions and this is where you look for regime shifts. Now, I want to finish quickly with two charts so that people understand a couple more aspects of this market. Let's talk, let's talk about SOPR, not SOFR, because we're definitely not talking about treasury repo here. We're comparing SOPR to funding rates in this next chart. So explain what we have declining leverage uh, in, this, in this situation. What is this declining leverage accompanied by? This is actually one of my favorite charts that I found in all my time studying markets. Uh, this is one of my favorites. So um, funding rate, I think a lot of people will be familiar with. It's essentially the interest rate that traders pay in futures markets, perpetual swaps. Um, so if the market is, if the futures are trading above the spot index price, longs will pay shorts and interest rate and vice versa. If it's trading below, shorts will take, pay longs. And this helps keep the, the futures price and the, um, and the spot price at the same level because they never expire. So it's essentially a gauge of how, um, it's the cost to take leverage. If it's positive, it means you have to pay a higher and higher interest rate to, for the privilege of taking long leverage. SOPA is purely on-chain data. It's looking at coins that are moving around on-chain. Um, this one particularly is actually entity adjusted. This, this uses a lot of Glassnode's most specialized and clean data. Um, it's essentially looking at how much profit, high values or loss, low values that the market is locking in. And when you overlie these two things, a little bit of adjustment, but when you overlie them, but just subtracting one from SOPA, they are the same chart. And I've been noodling over this for a long time and they seem to move in a very similar behavior. And my, the, the, the logic that I've finally come to, so, um, sorry, funding rates is obviously the, the interest rate in futures. SOPA is telling you the perspective of the spot holders. High values means they're taking chips off the table. Low values means that they're panicking. And they say, both instances, they believe that the market's going lower because if they're taking profit, they think now's a good time to get out. If they are taking a loss, it means that they're panicking and they think it's going to go lower. And the reason why both sides of that equation is we think it's going lower is because SOPA comes from the perspective of people who already own Bitcoin. So in an uptrend like we've just had, you can see that there's a, been a big spike. It's exactly the same point where we had the value days destroyed, multiple peaked. Lots of coins took a lot of profit and in the futures market, lots of people went very long with leverage. Funding rates are buyers. They're buying long. SOPA are sellers. They're taking profits. They're telling you the buying and the selling, but from two completely different markets, which is a really fascinating concept. Now, the fact that both of them are cooling down right now is a good sign because funding rates cooling down means a lot of that excess leverage on the buy side in futures is cooling off. In SOPA, a cooling down of SOPA means that people are not taking profits, which is sell side pressure. You're getting that reduction in the long-term holders actually distributing. So there's less supply for the market to absorb on a daily basis. So in both of those instances, it's telling us a bit of a cooling down on both the supply side and the levered buy side. So it's kind of telling us a complete story that that's usually a good sign, right? Allow these things to cool down, refine equilibrium, trade volumes will compress, you can see that this whole the whole thing tells a very consistent story. 
it's fa it's fascinating to think about these two markets totally different uh, segments of of the market the futures market the derivatives market and the spot market but relating the behavior as we get into different periods of the cycle in uh, theory you could use on-chain profit and loss to predict what the funding rate is doing in the futures market and vice versa and, and, and there's another metric I mentioned before, sell side risk ratio. It looks exactly the same as options implied volatility. So purely looking at on-chain profit and loss, you could start to get estimates for what the options market is pricing volatility at, which is, again, super, super amazing stuff. But uh, it all feeds into this, this long-term thesis I've got that Bitcoin is going to become just like an index for the global market. And all the information will be inside Bitcoin because we're starting to see it. It's incredibly fascinating. And I've hit the point in the episode in which my brain is starting to hurt because you've given me so much to think about. Let's conclude then with this uh, short-term holder SOPR indicator. Just break it down for us. What are you seeing here? What we want to see and what we don't want to see. Right now, it looks like we want to see this type of uh, yep. behavior. So why is that? Yeah. So so essentially, this short-term SOPR is one of my favorite indicators. So it's, it's SOPR from the previous section but looking only at those recent buyers. So again, high values, profit taking, low values, losses being taken. Now, it has this very particular pattern. It goes through these regime shifts. In a bear market, it will find resistance at a level of one regularly. Now, what is the level of one? It's break even. It means people who are moving coins are pretty much at their cost basis. So what that means is that anyone who would like, people sell at their cost basis in a bear because they're like, just get me out. Get me out of like, I'll, I'll take a small L, just get me out of this thing, I'm done. And any traders who are buying low in the dip and then selling into the, into the strength. In a bull, we flip it over and it actually becomes people buy their cost basis. They buy a bunch of Bitcoin, the market rallies, it trades back down, they go, ooh, you know what, I might just get back into that position. I, f I found value in it before, I find value in it again. And people keep doing it. Now, what you don't want to see is the market break or SOPA break down below that level and start finding resistance because that's bear market behavior, exit liquidity at my cost basis. Until, so I think a good way to think about MVRV and SOPA and most, most on-chain indicators, if they're in bull market mode, you expect them to be bull market mode until they're not. Same as price, right? You expect it to do what it does. The trend line will hold until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you have to then say, okay, I got to probably flip my bias. This is much the same. So at this point in time, we've had a couple of nice little undercuts. That's telling us the people who bought high are panic selling low. You kind of need to wash out some lettuce hands every now and then. It's basically what SOPA is telling us. Um, so a nice retest and then a bounce. If on the other hand, we slice through it and it starts finding resistance, you got to change your bias around. And we are not going to ask Check to trade our account, but we he will be the first person that we look to for the analysis as to when this bull market has shifted to the bear based off of the on-chain behavior. And to be honest, he won't know until after it has already peaked. He won't be able to tell you before because that's just not in the data itself. It'll just be a prediction at that point. Checkmate. Thank you so much for joining us once again at the Bitcoin layer. Tell people where they can find your brand new newsletter. Yeah, thank you, mate. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so as as, uh, as Nick mentioned, it's a, it's a brand new newsletter. Uh, it's, you'll find it at uh, check on ch uh, checkonchain.substack.com um, or checkonchain.com. We also have a charting suite at charts.checkonchain.com. Um, so do check that out. It's a, it's a new project. And really our thesis is that Bitcoin's volatile and it's it's a challenging journey, right? So um, my something I've learned in all my time is when you understand why the market does what it does, it makes it easier to hold, makes it easier to understand what's going on um, and also put some perspective on things, right? Sometimes when you just size up the market, you go, well, a lot of people are worrying about this thing on Twitter, but when I measure it, it's actually pretty small. And one of my favorite lines is, I love watching the narratives on Twitter not play out in the on-chain data and then you can essentially fade the narrative right and look at what's really going on so uh yeah anyone that's interested um you can either grab me on on twitter as well at, at underscore check matey but uh mate thanks for having me back on it's been a pleasure appreciate it and we appreciate you having a teaching mindset it helps us all learn we'll catch you guys next time special thanks to river for sponsoring this channel purchase bitcoin without any fees when you use rivers dca feature 
River has become our trusted source of accessing the Bitcoin market because they don't use any third party custodians. This is a very, very important thing to understand. River is not using another company to store the Bitcoin for them. They have their own multi-signature solutions, which means that they have designed their own way to make sure nobody else has responsibility for the Bitcoin for the time that you have River hold your Bitcoin for you on their platform once you have purchased it. So go check out river.com today. Thanks for sticking with us as always at the Bitcoin layer. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to our Substack at the bitcoinlayer.substack.com so that you can follow along our latest research and analysis.